Warning, we are not ready to fight because we love fighting. We are ready to fight because we are worth fighting for. Zoe Samudzi. I don't know where this came from, but I know who said it, so... I think it was just an article where he said it. <clears throat> the Black community is often considered a monolithic group, but it is actually a community of communities with many different interests. I think of being Black not so much as an ethnic category, but as an oppositional force or touchstone for looking at situations differently. Black culture has always been oppositional and is all about finding ways to creatively resist oppression here in the most racist country in the world. So when I speak of a black anarchism, it is not so much tied to the color of my skin, but to who I am as a person, as someone who can resist, who can see differently when I am stuck and thus live differently. Ashanti Alster. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Seriously Wrong Podcast. We are your hosts, starting with myself, Sean, and Aaron. Welcome to the show. Great to be here. Great to be here with you, Sean. Oh, well, thank you. Really excited for this episode. We have a great guest this week. It's St. Andrewism. St. Andrew makes these really great video essays. You can find them on YouTube, cover a whole bunch of topics, stuff like solar punk, anarchism 101 stuff, history, racial justice issues, colonialism. So we invited him on to talk to us about black anarchism. And we had a really interesting conversation with him about a variety of topics, sort of jumping in different places, really stimulating stuff, touching in a lot in particular on Lorenzo Camboa Irvin, American activist, black anarchist, and others. Yeah, Shanti Alston, Quasi Balagoon, Martin Sastra. St. Andrewism's video on black anarchism is a really great primer on these thinkers and their ideas and where they came from. It focuses in particular on this wave of black anarchists that in a lot of ways was born out of the Black Panther Party and their experiences there. Yeah, just highly recommend watching his video. In particular, Lorenzo Camboa Irvin has just a wild story where he is on the run for attempting to kill a KKK member and hijacks a plane to Cuba. But in Cuba, they throw him in prison and he's deported. It, that's not even half of it. It's such a wild story. I'd recommend also, if you're interested in the subject of this episode, Black Rose Books has the Black Anarchism Reader, which you can find online in PDF. Yeah, and we'll include links to a bunch of these essays and stuff. And as well, Lorenzo Comboa Irvin has a podcast called the Black Autonomy Podcast. And as always, the show is funded by our audience, our donors on Patreon, PayPal, and so on. If you want to support the show, that's the best way you can do it. It's that sweet six. $6 a month on Patreon. I know that St. Andrew also has a Patreon. Any help that you want to give is massively, massively appreciated. It's what allows us to do the show. So without further ado, I guess, do you want to get this road on the show? Oh, I think you meant get the show on the road. You said road on the show. Oh, It's, it's no big deal. <laughs> so I, just, I just wanted to, yeah. What was I thinking? Obviously, shows don't actually happen on the road most of the time, except for maybe like a traveling show. But then if the show was actually about to start... It would be getting off the road and onto the stage. Yeah, getting the show on the road would be like after the show's done. Like at the very end of the episode is when we should say, let's get this show on the road. Because yeah, it like, means we're like of taking here. off and going to another future episode. And then I said, get this road on the show, which is actually the words were even switched around. So it became a bit confused. But thank goodness we were able to unravel all that before we got this show on the stage and got started off the road. Yeah, and without further ado, the opening of the stage curtains. Are you serious? Today we're joined by St. Andrewism from YouTube. Thanks for being with us here today. I mean, not just from YouTube, but... Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I assume you also exist in the physical world and not just on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I'm on this call first. I wanted to start by asking you, Andrew, you've got some videos on this subject, but why is anarchism relevant to the Afro-diaspora? 
Black people around the world, what makes anarchism relevant to that struggle? Even if it doesn't go under that banner, the anarchist tradition is deeply imbued in the resistance of, I would say, all colonized people, Black people included. I think that it is our root out of this oppressive system that is holding us down, holding us back, and holding all of humanity back, really. It is a means by which we can understand ourselves and create and recreate ourselves and the society that we want to live in. It is the means by which we take the power into our own hands to form who we want to be and where we want to be as a people. That's where I see the relevance of it to us. Reading some of these works, I see a lot of focus on self-determination, the self-determination aspect of anarchism, that people should be able to decide for themselves and with their communities how they want to live. And that makes a lot of sense to me that for people who have been the victims of colonialism, that the message of self-determination, a philosophy that puts that in a central place, is going to be relevant to those kinds of struggles, to people who don't have that. I'm reminded of the quote I ended my Black Anarchism video on, a better society has to be written through inalienable self-determinations. And that will only happen when we realize that we are holding the pen. Zoe Simudzi. So I think that anarchism for colonized people is the recognition that we are holding the pen and the wielding of that pen to determine ourselves and our world. Yeah, that idea that is really just deeply ingrained in anarchism, that like a fully politically realized world would be a world where all people, all groups of people, have that ability to make their own choices and be the authors of their own lives. It's so important, not just because every person deserves that, but just because also, like, it's really true that there's a type of insight you get from being on the receiving end of a particular injustice into the shape of that injustice, because it's affecting you negatively, you're far more alerted to it. You can see it more clearly than someone who doesn't experience it. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I really noticed in reading Lorenzo Camboa Irvin's work, he made a connection between, I think it was in the pamphlet, Authoritarian Leftist, Kill the Cop in Your Head. Right. He draws this connection in that pamphlet between unity behind a single perspective versus a coalition of different perspectives. And he relates that to the anti-racist struggle in the United States and this idea that there's this tendency, or there was this tendency at the time, at least, among the white left of having vanguardist ideas of a small group of people governing on behalf of everyone. And he draws a connection between that centralization and that sense of a single right way to do things and the alternative of, say, like a coalition building exercise, a confederated exercise where there's individual autonomy in different groups and that you can build coalitions together and stuff like that. And white vanguardists are suggesting that we need unity in this sense that doesn't accept difference. And he uses this really great little phrase, which was a critique of white leftists saying, it makes sense that most of you speak of black, white unity and struggle against racism in such vague terms with such uncertainty in your voices or with an over-exaggerated forcefulness that seems contrived. <laughs> The connection that he was making was about the sort of historical problems of the white left in America not embracing differences in perspective and differences in experience and building coalitions and building groups. That connection to decentralized, confederated anarchism versus the centralized style. A world in which many worlds can exist, yeah. The approach that doesn't empower every individual to have self-determination and then confederate therein is something that is based on not respecting the positions that can come out of that process, is based out of not respecting a diversity of perspectives. I think it's almost a sense of elitism that has permeated a lot of leftist movements. Something everyone has to combat in themselves because, I mean, for myself, not to brag or anything, but I've always been a fairly intelligent guy top of my class, that sort of thing, back when I was in school, that is. It's important in your head not to devalue your own ability or your own intelligence, but to recognize that your perspective is always going to be incomplete. And no matter how many things you read, how much theory you have bounced around in your head, at the end of the day, somebody's experiences and somebody's analysis that may not be in the books may have a lot more impact, more 
relevance in the struggle than all that book smart. It's really a matter of humility, which I think is an essential part of any revolutionary mindset and being open to different perspectives and different experiences that aren't your own and that you might, as a default, turn your nose up at. And the issue of elitism on the left is something that comes up a lot in the writings of Ashanti Alston and Lorenzo Comboa Irvin. Yeah, especially Alston. I have this quasi Balagoon quote that is also on this. It's, what's as bad is that public movements can't grow into mass movements, not because of the apathy that they claim everyone else has, but because of a fantastic elitism. If they organize a mass movement, they'll lose their identities. They won't be so much smarter than the people they're supposed to be organizing and providing models for. And you could also see an inverse of that approach with the writings of people like Lorenzo Kambua Uven. And I have a quote of his here, which says, I'm not afraid of death, but don't want to uselessly die with revolutionary ideas on the brain, which could help the people. So his approach is, I want to share as much knowledge as I have with others so that I'm not just holding on to this here and holding it above people. I want to disseminate it as much as possible. And I think that's the mark of a true leader. A leader not in the hierarchical sense, but a leader in the sense of an ethical or moral example, someone with wisdom or experience. I think the mark of a true leader is someone who is constantly looking to disseminate that wisdom, that expertise, that knowledge, that experience to others, rather than trying to hold on to it and hold it over people to consolidate power. Right. It's also really interesting, the frame of putting it in contrast to death, because often in the sort of radical chic circles of more radical than thou posturing, there's nothing more ultimate and revolutionary (laughs) to some people than the idea that you might sacrifice your own body and life for causes that are bigger than yourselves. But it's an inversion to say that I might be more useful alive. (laughs) Yeah. Honestly, I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers, label anybody in any particular way, but I'm pretty sure that perspective of death for death's sake, dying for the cause sort of thing, is something that's very popular in fascist circles, one of their elements. And so I don't think it's something that we should be fantasizing about. It is something that happens, obviously. Every revolutionary movement has its casualties. And obviously we should honor those who fought and died for a better world. But the whole mythology around death is something that should be discarded. Something we should realize that, (laughs) like you were saying, we're better off alive. Yeah, I feel like it's important to let especially young revolutionaries know there's a lot of different forces It could be easy to get the sense that there's no higher calling for someone engaged in revolutionary or radical reformist politics or a combination therein of like really wanting to change society, getting to the root of causes radically and changing them, that this high frontier of it is self-sacrifice. But I think you're totally on the money to draw the connection to fascist mythology there, or even military mythology. This is the ideology of cannon fodder, right? Yeah, exactly. This is the ideology that if you're a military leader, you want to train your frontline people to be like, I'm going to die in battle for this. Like the war boys in Mad Max. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah, Huff some paint and then go run into... Witness me! (laughs) Fred Hampton called it revolutionary custerism. When you lead children into battle to die and you call it revolution. It's a harsh critique, I think, but it's also relevant because these movements for taking care of people, the hope in reforming society is not a movement towards more dead bodies. It's a movement towards more people living full and thriving lives. Exactly. The idea of an individual revolutionary as a unit of self-sacrifice, I think, is something that should be cast out. And I feel like there's so much to life, having children, growing old, all of these things can be revolutionary too. They can all be part of a bigger picture of a full life towards social change. Yeah, I think some people are a bit too self-serious when it comes to that sort of thing. They realize the importance of fun. Because what's the point in fighting for a better world if you're not going to try to enjoy yourself? And does not having fun actually make you better at fighting for a better world? I don't think that's really the case. 
Or does it just leave you feeling bitter? <laughs> yeah. I just recently saw, this is a bit of a tangent, but Current Affairs, they started doing this cooking show and it's this sort of goofy show about this socialist who doesn't know how to cook being taught how to cook. <laughs> and there was this guy in the comment section flipping out of like everyone throughout history, all serious revolutionaries would never humiliate themselves. Oh my God. And I, I was just blown away. That ties back <laughs> into this thing that I tried to emphasize in my mutually video, which is that... Just as there's a elitist tradition, there's also this tradition of seeing care work as lesser than. And that's also really part of the left's repeated failure to truly confront patriarchal ideas in their spaces. So you see things like care work, whether it be, you know, visiting people or caring for people, caring for the sick or ill, cooking and bringing meals for people. You see that as the less important work, the women's work, even if you don't call it the women's work. It's basically what it's seen as. And because it's seen as that, it's seen as less valuable. So that really rings true to my experience, looking at that sort of devaluation of care work. No, absolutely. Tying back into the cannon fodder narrative too, I've just noticed a lot that the people who take that stance on things often also have a very masculinist view of what's important going out into the world and fighting and rugged coal miners yeah the <laughs> workers at the factories with their toolboxes big hammers yeah <laughs> revolution is when the big tough oil stained workers are moved to arms and then <laughs> commit unspeakable atrocities <laughs> yeah that's the pinnacle that is the pinnacle another thing i want to emphasize here as well as we're on this topic is something that a lot of black revolutionary elders have been emphasizing in their later years now, people like Angela Davis and Irvin, they've been telling the younger folks, yo, relax, chill, take care of yourself. Because in their era, in their period, you know, it's like everything for the cause. But that also led to a lot of people burning out really badly. A lot of people ended up falling to addiction or mental affliction. So what you find a lot of them emphasizing is that an important part of revolutionary work is caring for yourself. So just to keep that in mind as well. If you've ever worked long hours for a job or working 10-hour days, 11-hour days, you just get so burned out. You can't do your work anymore. It's just so bad for you when you're not taking that leisure time. And then to think that we're going to put that normative request onto the revolutionary community. Remember, you're working 24 hours a day. You're on the clock for the people. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's not a healthy, balanced way to live. And that's another thing. And this, this also ties back to elitism. I find people, as soon as they get revolutionary ideas, they suddenly seem to separate themselves from this amorphous group known as the people. It's important to remind yourself that you are part of the people. You're embedded in the people. You're connected with the people, your relationships, your friendships, your families. They are the people and you are the people. So get out of that impulse to remove yourself and to lift yourself above because you have this knowledge. Yeah, I had this experience like that early in my political journey. I remember I had this moment of feeling like I care a lot about these things. I'm really interested in politics and research. And I started getting more distant from people in my life. I was filtering for more people who were on this wavelength. And it didn't take very long for me to realize that I was going to have no friends if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't keep the door open to having a variety of perspectives in my life and keep nourishing the existing relationships I had. Yeah. I feel like it connects really deeply to what you were saying in terms of being part of the people and having the sense of being above or separate from the people, it's like the places that we are and the connections that we have in our lives, these organic connections are things that can have political value in themselves. It's a really good point that you brought up in terms of the separation between the revolutionary and the people is this fictional construct, almost hierarchical, that leads to all of these issues. Yeah. Bringing it back to self-care, I have this part of a quote from Ashanti Austin where he says, we are struggling and we will make it rough for them, but struggle is going to be rough for us too. This is why we have to find ways to love and support each other through tough times. It's more than just believing that we can win. We need to have the structures in place that can carry us through when we feel like we cannot go another step. I think we can move again if we can figure out some of those things. The system has got to come down. It hurts us every day and we can't give up. We have to get there. We have to find new ways. Anarchism, if it means anything, means being open to whatever it takes in thinking, living, and in our relationships to live fully and win.
In some ways, I think they are both the same. Living to the fullest is to win. Of course, we will and must clash with our oppressors, and we need to find good ways of doing it. Remember those on the bottom who are most impacted by this. And to fast forward a bit, you all can do this. You have the vision, you have the creativity. Do not allow anyone to lock that down. It's such an important point, and I see it a lot in these writings. In addition to fighting, which is an important part of it, we also need to take care of one another. In another Balagoon quote I had here, he's saying that collectives have to operate as a propaganda unit. But then one of the examples that's given is if a collective chooses to recycle and accumulate capital for a co-op of sorts, then the people will see people working together and they'll see a process that can be duplicated. With the egghead sitting around spinning yarns and isms, that can be duplicated, but for what? The masses are smart not to get involved in any more bullshit. Yeah. (laughs) Saying that it's propaganda the deed kind of, but in a way of, if they see us organizing in ways that's helping. In the way of not putting a bullet between a politician's eyes. Yeah. It's a different kind of propaganda the deed, basically. (laughs) Yeah, like helping people. And then they'll see that we're helping and they'll say, oh, that's a good thing. And we could do that. We could be part of that. Yeah. The egghead thing. I've been noticing this recently. There's this really insidious, and I think I participated in it too. There's this leftist voice that people put on, especially on the internet, where everything is above it all. Like the real issue is this. This analysis shall change the world. And it always have all these $10 words in it and stuff. And I have no idea what the fuck these guys are talking about. Twitter guys I'm thinking of. This really posturing, heavy intellectualism. I think of that as being a really elitist form of political engagement. And especially when you contrast it to the support of care work and the work of building social relationships that we would want to be replicated in another society. Not to say that there's no place for theory, and I think that theory and practice are interconnected in a lot of ways, but it does occur to me how many people are getting involved in politics and they're seeing these leaders who are, the big thing that they achieve is pontificating well, and then they're like, I want to pontificate well too, and they're (laughs) like, I'm going to be a little pontificator. We don't actually need that many pontificators. The discourse is useful, but it's not actually that we need more people to act like eggheads. We need work to be done. Yeah, absolutely. I find that you have certain writers and stuff that go in that direction as well. There's a sort of a technocratic side to the left that also has that whole elitist aspect to it. But also you see a lot of modern theorists or modern pseudo theorists trying to replicate the writing styles of 19th century thinkers. But what I find great about people like Ashanti Alston, Lorenzo Combo Irvin, Kwasi Balagoon, is that they don't separate themselves from the people in their style of writing. Their ideas are high quality, but they don't feel the need, like you were mentioning, to sprinkle in a bunch of $10 words to make an impression or make an impact. Their writings can be shared with people at any age or stage, and they would get what they're trying to say without too much prior political baggage or theoretical understanding. And now it's time for another segment of Wrong Boys Children's Book Media Analysis. So Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, he's got this story that I was read as a child. It's a story against racism, and it's called The Sneeches. So you have these like Sesame Street type characters, these like big birds with big bellies called Sneeches. And some of them have stars on their belly, some of them don't. And the star belly ones like discriminate against the ones that don't. And sort of the parable of the story is that discrimination is wrong. Yeah, it's a, it sounds like basically kind of like, but what does skin color matter? It, you know, it's just the, whether you have a star on your belly or not, like it's such an obviously inconsequential thing. It, it feels like it riffing on the like, you know, it's just like, it's just skin deep like just like people are caught up on skin color and that is goofy because what difference does that make and the way that it tells that story is like a monkey in a car comes to town and he sells he he sells the plain belly sneeches uh, stars for their bellies and then the originally star-bellied sneeches are like pissed off because they no longer have their like 
aristocracy of the stars. It's, you know, uh, disintegrated by capitalism. So then they go to the monkey and he's like, well, I'll take off your stars for $3. And they're like, great, well, then we'll be starless and then we can lord it over them. And they're like, oh, now having no stars is the real shit. Like, fuck you guys. Eventually, it becomes this sort of cycle of the monkey in the car is selling them, removing and <laughs> putting the stars off and taking them off again. And they're fighting with each other about who's the on top. The monkey's and raking in all the cash. He's laughing all the way to the bank and he leaves town. He's like, oh, you Sneetches will ever, never learn. And then the last paragraph is like, but he was wrong. And the Sneetches did learn <laughs> that the star crap doesn't matter so much. The end. And <laughs> something I really like about it in revisiting it is how there is the sort of like capitalism turning people against each other. This sort of like, you know, the business class wants to keep people separated fighting for their own interests and not having a universalist anti-racist platform so they can drive down everyone's wages by making them compete with each other and think of you know immigrants as the problem etc instead of thinking about the people who are actually paying them the low wages as the problem so that's great but there's also some weird stuff in snitches like just in general the idea of a machine that changes your race doesn't map really well yeah when you start swapping out plain belly snitch and star belly snitch for black people and white people then the machine that yeah it's <laughs> it starts getting a bit more yikesy and the overall message at the end that like oh we just realized that stars don't matter and that's it that solved it is the moral at the end like skin color doesn't matter and we realized it and it's done now mm -hmm. so just ignore it in all contexts <laughs> like it's it has no relevance yeah there's no there's no like pages in the book describing like the Starbelly people analyzing the history of the Starbelly depression of plain bellied sneeches and how it's still affecting them today, and like the unlearning, the kind of like attitudes that they were holding that caused them to want to. When, when the plain bellies start becoming star bellies, the, to be like, oh, we still want to be different. So, like, what is that attitude? Yeah, and, that. That, it's an interesting little thing, you know, because the, the story almost plays it as like, oh, these Sneetches, they go so star crazy that they all start fighting. But it's like one group of Sneetches has been excluded. Their children aren't able to play with the star bellied children and stuff it mentions, you know, like this is a serious cultural and social exclusion that the plain belly Sneetches have been facing in this society and then there's this demented moment when the jig is up and everyone has stars on their bellies that the the star bellied Sneetches are like we need to find some way to continue this exclusion and domination so let's go pay to have our stars removed and dr seuss just breezes by it he's just like oh you know star bellies and plain bellies they all fight the end but unless you ignore it <laughs> yeah but yeah that has to be the result of like a long term like fixation that they have on being on the top of this hierarchy and right so this domination could persist still in sneech society and then maybe they give up on the star thing but at the same time there's people who are sort of like used to the the wages of starness right. who who find ways to exclude and demean and and Dr. Seuss is silent on this. Dr. Seuss went to the grave having not well I mean and what do we expect from <laughs> From what I understand from conservatives freaking out, was that like a year ago now, Dr. Seuss, some of his old books stopped being sold because of racist caricature of Asian people. So, you know, while he had obviously some explicitly anti-racist beliefs, he still obviously fell short in many ways of, you know, being effectively anti-racist in all these areas. Yeah, there's no part in the Sneetches where, like, a star-bellied Sneetch cartoonist recants for all of his, like, offensive caricatures of plain belly Sneetches, like, <laughs> and, like, puts down his pen and he's like, I'm going to do better, you know, like, he didn't have that sort of reflection. So there was a lot of inadequacies uh, within Dr. Seuss's The Sneetches, but, you know, there was also a glimmer, I thought, a real revolutionary sort of glimmer that... Aaron and I, we thought we'd try to, to bring out by bringing in another influence. Yeah, doing a kind of, as they say in the film industry these days, a sort of reboot. This can be read as maybe in the same universe or a slightly different but similar universe. Mm -hmm. um, this is like HBO's The Sneetches or like... In the world of music, you could sort of classify this as like a remix because we've taken mm -hmm. another strong influence. You know, we've taken the beats from Dr. Seuss 
But now the lyrics, the chorus, the melody, metaphorically speaking, is coming from Lorenzo Comboa Irvin's essay, The Progressive Plantation, which is a reflection on racism within anarchists and radical movements. Yeah. So what would the Sneetch story have looked like if Dr. Seuss had consulted Lorenzo Comboa Irvin on In these like issues? In 2013 or something. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, hey, kids. Hey. Hi, children. We're here to read you a story. How's everyone feeling today? Ooh, oh, yeah. That's some energy in the crowd. You kids like Dr. Seuss? Are you guys ready for a No Holds Barred sequel, Sneetches 2? It's kind of a reboot. It's kind of a sequel, kind of a requel. It's ambiguous, but I personally think it takes place about 80 years after the first Sneech, after the domination in their society inexorably rose to the surface and star-bellied society resumed. Other people sort of think of it as more of a reboot. Uh, Kids love relevant modern updates of existing properties, existing stories, I should say, and to call them a property is to conceive the... We've developed some... Dr. Seuss properties for you children. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, so telling a story. It's something humans have done for as long as history. Do you want to start or should I start? <clears throat> you know what? You can start. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, the star-bellied Sneeches had bellies with stars. The plain-bellied Sneeches had none upon theirs. Those stars weren't so big. They were really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. Because the star-bellied Sneetches had this mark upon theirs, they would brag, we're all equal, I don't even see stars. With their snoots in their air, they would snort and they'd bob, while star-bellied bosses hired other star-bellies for jobs. And when plain-bellied Sneetches do get higher vocation, their paycheck depends on defending the corporation. They're the plain belly rep, tasked to stop discrimination, and if racism continues, the star-bellied bosses can replace them. So the star-bellied Sneetches, by their deeds and not being, star-picked and star-chose which things they were seeing. The horrors around them make not a dent in their thoughts, as plain bellies are harassed and shot by star-bellied cops. Many star-bellied Sneetches call loudly, this unfairness must be ending, and then hold conferences on tolerance with no plain bellies attending. No plain bellied voices to rise above the star crossed chatter, all saying, In this house, love is love, and plain belly lives matter. By giving more star crumbs to the star bellied working Sneeches, star bosses sow division so that Sneech solidarity decreases. They push down the wages the plain bellies can reaches, and star wash the history with star leadership's bleaches. The radical star bellies all promised real action, but dismissed plain belly concerns as just a distraction. They said true power lies with politicians, landlords, and bosses of all kind. The real stars are theirs. There's none upon mine. We must fight these real enemies through total sneech unity. I have plain belly friends, and they all agree to with me. Wait your turn, said the star bellies, once the real fight is done. But too often, history has shown that later never comes. Many left-wing Sneetches with stars still find themselves caught, ultimately conditioned with the same star supremacist thoughts. You find elsewhere in this star-bellied supremacist sieve that exploits and extracts more than plain bellies would give. So the plain belly Sneetches might not trust or work united with star-bellied Sneetches who don't try to fight it who don't amplify plain belly Sneech's struggles as real, and instead hide in delusions to protect star-bellied feels. And a star-bellied movement filled with star-bellied leaders, rather than plain belly liberation and autonomy, is weaker. It takes real work to renounce taking dubs so unjustly. Systems which harm you might harm your neighbors doubly. Working class Sneetches have bellies of all types, with different struggles and different dislikes. Listen to everyone, Lived experience is personal. The fight for all bellies dissimilar can be made universal. Oppressed Sneetches have a right to self-determination, to set their own rules and make their own organizations. They don't need backseat star-bellied opticians. Remember, one Sneech mouth to talk, two Sneech ears to listen. This is basic, it's justice, it should just be elementary. 
but star-bellied radicals want to debate it endlessly. It's not fun to confront shortcomings, your own especially, but you can't confront Sneech society without confronting star supremacy. Thank you, Chilton. It was uh, our, yeah, it was our yeah, pleasure. Was great. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I felt that the ending of this one left it much more open to a sequel than the original. Right, yeah, no, the first one has a really tight bow. No, it, we just, you know, you don't tell stories like that anymore. You always want to leave it open. Sneetches 3, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it took a lot of work to think through how to continue the first story because of that hard ending. So we didn't want to make the same mistake twice this time. Right, and I mean, I think that's part of the issue with the first one, really, we can see now in retrospect, is it implied it could even foresee an end to something as pernicious as racism, which I think this sequel really, you know, it's an ongoing thing. It's a call to action in that way. You know, it's not about not acknowledging difference, but working towards a universal platform that acknowledges difference through unity and diversity. Any other questions? Yes, I, w I was just wondering if there wasn't any machine race changing machines. Will you bring those back? You know, that was one element from the original story. We just really thought was best left to the past. You know, we get what Seuss was trying to do with it in and a way. Yeah, and appreciate it in a, in, in a sense. Sure. But like, it didn't feel like a, a modern story element to keep in there. So, you and know, we wanted to take on the sort of the political side, we wanted to take more influence from the tradition of like anti-racist critiques and like not take it as much from the Dr. Seuss because race changing machines are yeah, not it, when you read anti-racist critiques, there's not a lot it of race ever comes up. Yeah. yeah. And we wanted to sort of pull from that side. Any more questions? understanding the plans for sequels and all that i'm just really concerned i really want to know do you think that in the future future of sneech society they they might one day fully end all sneech racism or i just want to know like do you think there'll be a happy ending at the very end of all of this look people have accused us before of being optimistic so i'll preface by saying that first but I don't know. I can't speak for Sean, but I think the Sne I think the Sneeches can do it. Yeah, I think the Sneeches. I mean, there's a lot of crises that the Sneeches face. They've got interconnected elements, and I, I'd say I, it takes work, and you know, there's stops and starts, and people do things wrong, and it's not easy. But I think the Sneeches will be able to eventually not just address the tension between the star bellies and the plain bellies in Sneech society, but also more fundamentally address the systems of Sneech domination. You know, the urge to want to remove the star when it's all of a sudden everyone has the star, you know, that sort of ideology of domination, this sort of stuff, it can be worked on. And it's, it's hard to say that there's going to be like some perfect Sneech outcome someday, but I'd say that I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic in Sneech's capacity to dream morally together, dream ethically, and be brave enough to imagine themselves being successful. So I hope that I... I yeah, sort of typical media future answer, non-answer thing. You know, we got to avoid <laughs> yeah. spoiler skits. But I hope Otherwise that you got something to out of the next that. reading. You're not going to be coming to the next live reading at the library. Kids, thank you so much. Uh, the next reading is about to start. I think the next one is that reboot of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, mixing in elements of Gender Trouble by Judith Butler. I've been looking forward to that one. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be switching. I'm going to be in the audience with you kids watching this next story be read at the library. So that's our time. But thank you so much. Bye, bye. bye. Something I'm curious about, Andrew, what brought you to anarchism? What was it that attracted you to these ideas? And how did you get involved in studying and popularizing them? Well, honestly, I started off in life really in an environment that was more conservative in the sort of consequences of colonialism sense of respectability and all that jazz. My first introduction to contemporary politics and getting into that political space was unfortunately reactionary because that was sort of the default that I was familiar with. Eventually, however, I diverted that course and ended up discovering anarchism on Tumblr of all places. That was my first exposure to socialism, anarchism, all that jazz. I was just taking it in through that process of osmosis, just kind of taking things in. Eventually I found BreadTube and, you know, that whole space with all these figures and debunking these right-wing figures and that sort of thing. That was my space for a bit. But then I started working and I was depressed. And so I wanted to go further than that because my job sucked and 
I felt like I needed something to learn about, to preserve my sanity and to gain a sense of direction. And so I ended up listening to the Communist Manifesto audiobook and the Conquest of Red audiobook at my workplace while I was doing my work. I found that to be very enjoyable. I found the ideas exciting and all those different things. But I was still in that limbo space of lacking a coherent political perspective. There were a lot of ideas I knew I wanted to incorporate, but I wasn't sure where it all fit. I decided I wanted to dig in a bit deeper. Between late 2019 and early 2020, I ended up discovering some theoretical books. And then the Black Lives Matter protest in summer 2020 sparked that need for further exploration. So I dug in and developed an understanding of where I was politically. Although it was popular at the time to speak of Marx and Lenin and these sort of figures, I knew I wasn't really interested in that corner because I didn't trust politicians. And I felt like entrusting power into the hands of certain people was dangerous. Even though I myself had been told growing up, oh, you know, you'd make a great prime minister or president, whatever the case may be, it wasn't something that I wanted. And it wasn't something that I trusted other people to have. Because if I couldn't trust myself with that power, why would I trust somebody else with it? I was always more leaning in that anarchist direction. And as I read more anarchist literature, by the works of Malatesta, and I also read Anarchism of the Black Revolution by Lorenzo Comboa Irvin, that basically solidified for me that. This was the kind of route for me. This is the direction I wanted to go in, and here I am now. That's cool. It's interesting that when you were young, you had more of a conservative outlook, just from the context you were raised in and stuff like that. Yeah, it was a religious right context. Interesting. I know a decent amount of people who have really, really radical, cool politics who started out in that context as well. Was there a moment where you felt the rejection of the old way of seeing? Yeah. This no longer yeah. represents how I feel. It was definitely a process, but I could definitely pinpoint a moment. The process was seeing things like friends of mine who were LGBT and realizing that the perspective that I'm supposed to hold about them doesn't make any sense to me. And so I kind of quietly discarded that. Because you see, my religious separation is connected with my political journey. It was very deeply intertwined because as I was letting go of certain religious right perspectives on things like abortion, on LGBTQ rights, on evolution and the Big Bang Theory and that kind of thing. I was realizing that this sort of right wing, sort of reactionary perspective on the world was not something that I actually genuinely held. I think one of the main things that made that click was me realizing that this perspective on women and women's bodies that you were supposed to hold it wasn't one that I was comfortable with. And that's what basically got me out to that space. Feminism, that is. That's really interesting because there's this argument that in order to appeal to, quote unquote, the people, we need to not care about feminism or we need to not care about racial justice and stuff like that because the wrench carrying guys are <laughs> not, yeah. not in. But I mean, white is silent and something like that, you know? Right. Yeah. It sounds also in leaving these inherited perspectives that it was actually sort of the opposite for you, that it was the insight that women deserve rights in society and they're mistreated. A diversity of experience. Yeah. I think it also, like my journey personally, illuminated for me that it's very easy for otherwise well-intentioned people, otherwise good people, because I would consider myself a good person, to hold rather damaging perspectives solely because that's the dogma that they were raised in. No, oh, yeah. I relate to a lot of what you're saying. I grew up in a smaller city almost entirely white. And the type of conservatism that I was immersed in was a lot of this subtle default assumption type conservatism. It came up more in my thought at the time here in Canada with First Nations people and indigenous struggles. But just this idea of, oh, that was so long ago. Why are people still complaining about that? And like, sure, white people did bad things in the past and colonialism happened in the past. But it's been decades since we've passed whatever laws or that sort of common sense white liberal perspective that yes, racism bad, but we've basically got it fixed already. Like that was really ingrained in me when I was 
younger and being exposed to more different people really forced me to, I really liked the way you put this, to realize that I didn't genuinely hold those positions because I just hadn't actually thought about the realities of what's still going on. But when you're immersed in it, that's just how you think about things. It's what you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to sleep. But those people, like myself, who are in that space and are come out of it, it's easier to stay in that space because a lot of your relationships would be with people who would have been affirming that perspective. And so it's more difficult to come out of that and find your own way. Obviously, it's more rewarding and morally beneficial, but it can be tough as well. It was in my experience. So, Andrew, if you were radicalized on Tumblr, as they say, <laughs> if, you, if you were experiencing politics for the first time through Tumblr and social media, experiencing really thinking through and forming your perspectives, was there ever a time in that where you considered taking a Marxist, Marxist-Leninist approach or something like that rather than an anarchist approach? Yes, yes. It was actually when I was on Twitter that I was being more exposed to the Marxist-Leninist perspective because they do tend to have a lot of the larger voices outside of the sock dem scene. And well, I dismissed sock dems a while before then. So I was looking for something more radical. And so I was following a lot of Marxist Leninist types, but I found that even while I was soaking it in, I took issue with it, with parts of it. And when I took a step back, I found even more issues with it. And so that's what kind of pushed me away from going down that road. I think one of the main things for me Besides what felt to me like simplistic perspectives on history, on geopolitics, I also found that they didn't seem to be realistic. And I know everyone says that about other people's politics, but they didn't seem to be a realistic strategy or perspective on how we build the world we want to live in. Because even though there were certain misconceptions about places like the USSR or China that I had held, I honestly hadn't held that many, probably because I didn't grow up in an education system that was super Cold War era rhetoric. So it was never a big thing for me. And more so I sort of looked at the stance people were taking, what felt to me like very simplistic stances, very unnuanced, very strong stances on a lot of issues. That really turned me off. Some main ones for me were things like the portrayal of the situation in Venezuela, which obviously the Americans played a role in that. Nobody's denying that. But I find there's this habit in that space of reducing everything to American action and removing the agency of the people who are not American, essentially. So obviously American intervention has played a role in basically every country in the world, but that doesn't negate other forces that are at play in people's countries. And I speak of Venezuela specifically because Trinidad, for those who don't know, is right next to Venezuela. And so I know a lot of Venezuelans. I'm friends with a lot of Venezuelans. And that ties back to another thing. All my Venezuelan acquaintances and friends have different perspectives on Venezuela and on the Venezuelan government. And I find that another practice rubbed me the wrong way as someone who is not America and being exposed to the primarily American Marxist Leninist side of the left was this sort of reduction of non Americans into these politically simplified blobs. There's this line that I saw people throwing around when I was in that space that X hundreds of millions of people are committed Marxist Leninists. <laughs> and that sort of rhetoric, X million people are committed party members and that sort of thing. And that struck me as rather odd because there could be other motivations and there are other motivations as to why someone may get involved in a one party state. To summarize, basically I found issues with the way that they portrayed history, their approach to revolution and their stance on the people, which struck me as elitist and simplistic. When you were talking, one of the first things I thought of was the X million Marxist Leninist can't be wrong thing. It's really goofy. It's kind of like being like, oh, you know, 7 billion people live under capitalism, so it must be great. Exactly. You could point to that for literally anything. That's another thing. As someone who was homeschooled and self-schooled, one of the primary subjects that I read and studied was logical fallacies and stuff. And so 
obviously everyone partakes in logical fallacies, but I found some of the ones that I encountered on that side were so blatantly and obviously logical fallacies, especially the argumentum ad populum. There's a lot of genetic fallacy in terms of dismissing entire perspectives or schools of thought based on their origin. It can really go on, but that was the main one for me. That sort of simplification of people and the diversity of people and the motivations of people. It kind of just showed to me that for all their posturing about being the voice of the masses, I don't think they understand people as well as they think they do. And that to me is a problem. When I see them draping themselves in old, decrepit iconography and plastering flags on themselves and going to protest to get people to register for their party, it strikes me as disconnected from the actual needs and aims of people and quite frankly ineffective yeah it's for me the same and i'm not saying this to pick a fight or anything but likewise likewise for me it really resonates with what you're saying in my political development it was compelling and like i'd actually never heard the condoms on pizza thing but condoms on pizza thing is a great example of there's this rumor in the u.s that in cuba they put condoms on pizza instead of cheese because it was so rough there but it doesn't really make any sense because who would want to eat a condom you're so desperate for pizza you're eating condoms just eat a pizza without condom <laughs> <laughs> they've got the sauce and everything but they're out of cheese so they're just like oh i guess this latex condom will work it's usually used for preventing pregnancy but i don't know it's crazy communism over here and they're banging themselves in the head with frying pans you in counter that stuff and you're like, you know what, this perspective, they're calling out some bullshit that's actually bullshit. And I agree with that. Yeah, exactly. But then they're also expecting you to start swallowing some bullshit. They want you to switch the state propaganda outlet that you consume from. I appreciate your critiques of American media and American corporate media. That is absolutely needed. But don't turn around and swallow the PR of other governments wholesale. That ties into part of what got me into anarchism as well. I don't trust governments. I don't trust power, concentrated power. I don't trust people who chase after concentrated power. I've not been victim to, but I have seen the abuse that people have endured under power. As someone who was out of the school system, who had friends in the school system, it's probably kind of a childish comparison to compare school to the state for some, but... The state education system is part of what reproduces this whole system. So I tend to draw this comparison a lot, but I've seen how those hierarchies and those structures of authority have really caused more harm than good and has led to a lot of abuse in their lives. And so it's not something I could trust. I've seen a lot of politicking, you know, a lot of politicking <laughs> in my lifetime, in my short lifespan. And so I have a habit of mistrusting the various outlets on either side. That's also why I try to emphasize, not in a radical centrist sense, but be critical of the media you consume, but also try to circumvent the media and listen to what's happening on the ground. Talk to people, form those actual solidarity connections so that you're not getting your entire perspective on a country from that country's government. And try not to get just one perspective either. Try to get diversity of perspectives because no one person could speak for a whole people. Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by Vanguard Country Club, because we know what the masses don't. Are you part of the most class-conscious section of the proletariat? Mm-hmm. Do you serve as a manifestation of proletarian political power? Mm -hmm. Do you know this because you've been given an official position of authority by the party? Then come on down and enjoy our beautiful rolling hills, pristine Olympic-sized swimming pool, and beautiful tree-lined golf course. For the top brass of the party, our club is a home away from home and a private hub for activity, sport, dining, entertainment, socialization, and proletarian business. Our membership is invite only because only the most dedicated and educated of the inner circle can play a leading role in country club society. I want to invite you and everyone in your well-educated middle-class cadre to come on down. We all know that the real decisions aren't made in the Politburo. They're made down on the links. Join our great men as they theorize about how we bring communism to the masses. Thomas, when are we going to crush that rebellion? 
Just kidding. See you on the links. Oh, it's great being part of the most advanced section of the proletariat, isn't it? <laughs> Time to make some real decisions among us top-level thinkers. Our golf course is a par 72, 6,804 yard Taylorist institution featuring 18 holes hidden away just minutes from the slums of downtown Metropolis. The finest golf experience in the entire temporarily authoritarian, temporary, wink, authoritarian socialist government. One day the course will wither away, but until then, capitalize on this truly unique opportunity to secure the country club membership and revolution you've always dreamed of. Because power to the people doesn't have to stay with the people. It's hard at the top in the vanguard, and the masses don't demand self-sacrifice. They need you at your best, so when you're directing them for their six days of work, you're going to be making the right decisions to hit those targets. In an increasingly tumultuous world, it's a real advantage to be able to go to your club and enjoy the delicious breakfast and lunch menus, bar specials, exclusive holiday parties, and events without pesky striking workers that just ruin all the important decision making. Ruin all the fun. Can't they see the industrial targets we're hitting? What are they complaining about? You know what they say, that's why you need some people at the top. Because the masses just don't understand. Enjoy breathtaking views while taking the breath away from striking workers. How else are we going to raise these amateurs to the level of revolutionaries, am I right? Come cry at our pictures of blood-soaked statesmen and study the theories they wrote to excuse their own power. And, and to the critics, have you gentlemen ever seen a revolution? The revolution is the most country club thing there is. Vanguard Country Club. Because who else can make better decisions for them than us? I remember this quote that I had read while I was preparing the Black Anarchism video that I did. It was something that Martin Sostra wrote. He was one of the first Black anarchists of the newest wave of Black anarchists in the late 20th century, because there had been Black anarchists in Brazil and the US in those labor struggles, but that was pre-World Wars kind of thing. But yeah, Martin Sostra, he had a bookstore, a radical bookstore, and he was really embedded in his community. He was a big figure in prisoner rights and that sort of thing, that fight. And he's one of the influences that introduced Lorenzo Combo Irvin to anarchism. And what he said just kind of resonates with me. And it's probably something that I would have said even before I had fully understood anarchism. It was, I cannot submit to injustices, even minor ones. Once one starts submitting to minor injustices and rationalizes them away, the accumulation creates a major oppression. That's how entire peoples fell into slavery. And that's the quote. It ties into what we were talking about in terms of Marxist Leninists and my perspective on that demand to submit to this one dogma, this one idea, this one figure, or this group of figures for your salvation. And if we don't look at the really terrible consequences of how that's played out, we're doomed to replicate it. That is why I place so much emphasis not just as a Black person, as much as I could separate my Blackness from my revolutionariness. I think that all revolutionaries need to look at and listen to the contemporary voices of people like Alston and Irvin, but also the now deceased Balagoon and Sostra, because they had experience with this form, this method of organizing, this approach and It failed. It failed them. And they had their reasons for that. And I guess that's something we could talk about now. A lot of these Black anarchist thinkers I had not been familiar with until I think it must have been late 2019 or 2020. And it was through Twitter, actually through the Black Socialists of America, Lorenzo Kumbora Irvin and Kawasi Balagoon were mentioned. And it really... Shout out to the BSE. But it blew my mind, too, because I had been looking at and understanding some of the history of the Black Panther Party, and I was obviously very entranced and sympathetic and fascinated with this history and outraged at the way that the state had treated these movements for self-determination. And to find out that not just one, but many former Black Panthers 
went on to later embrace anarchism and went on to embrace anarchism as a result of their experiences with some of the failures of Leninist vanguard organizing that they'd experienced in the Black Panther Party. Yeah. Balagoon, Irvin, Alston, they were all former Black Panthers. And there was also Don Cox, although he doesn't identify as an anarchist in his biography, he does really echo these same critiques yeah. of talking about the centralization, the lack of participation. Don Cox was a central committee member, and he said that he never made a single decision in the Black Panther Party, that it was all given to the chief of staff to make these decisions. He actually said that the state suppression, <laughs> not to say that the state suppression of the Black Panther Party didn't matter, but that even with all the state suppression, he thought that the ultimate failure of the Black Panther Party was a result of this centralized organizing style that wasn't able to handle the head of the organization being chopped off because everything is flowing down from this one person. So it makes it easier to sabotage an organization if it's not distributed, if it's not confederated, and it's not democratic and participatory. Yeah. And finding this out is something that just really honestly rocked my philosophical world. Yeah, because... And this is also what bothers me about ML approaches to history and stuff. When you simplify things to just what America did, you miss out on a lot of crucial, crucial analysis that could have been otherwise beneficial, but you just sort of painted over it in favor of an easy-to-consume narrative. Because while Quentin Peru was part of what was responsible for the downfall of the Black Panther Party, even prior to that downfall, there were already issues in the party by the members themselves. And it's easy to dismiss anyone who disagrees with you as counter-revolutionary CIA agent, but there's value in seeing and listening to the nuances of those who were involved in it. And that's why it's important to emphasize these four Black Panthers, because they don't get talked about, even though a lot of them are still alive. No shade to Angela Davis, because my respect to her. But you hear about people like Angela Davis and Huey P. Newton, all these figures. But what's ignored is the people who were critical of the movement, especially the less flashy, the sort of rank and file of the movement, who had their own critiques, who were just as committed as everyone else, but saw issues with it and ended up coming out of it. And I think it's important to listen to them so that we can learn from the mistakes of the past rather than trying to replicate them. Because if we do the same sort of vanguard party approach, what are we waiting for? Quintel Pro 2.0? I feel like that's rushing towards defeat, foolishly and unnecessarily, because we don't have time to be repeating past mistakes. Yeah, you could just do the same thing over and over again, and then just always blame it and be like, oh yeah, someone must have interfered from the outside again. Let's, <laughs> let's start from square one. Yeah, and that sort of fed jacketing and cop jacketing. The Black Panther Party did a lot of that as well. And all the people who they thought were cops actually weren't and the people they didn't think were cops were right well yeah no it was the cops doing the cop jacketing right because <laughs> they realized that if you put everyone on their back heels you're not revolutionary enough you're not willing to do this that sort of thing make people defensive afraid that they're going to be called a cop or whatever and then you're sowing seeds of distrust it's a very effective method of disrupting a movement well, and you can push people further and further. You can push them out of what's actually necessary. You can push people to do more radical, aggressive, and unpopular actions. The types of things that make people not like you as much. Because then it's like this game of chicken of who's tough enough, who's radical enough, who's radical cheek enough. And that's a force that historically has been used by infiltrators to make organizations less effective. And in particular, in the Black Panther Party that was used by police informants. Yeah. One thing that isn't talked about much with the Black Panther Party is there was actually a divide, a separation between the West Coast Panthers and the East Coast Panthers in terms of what they emphasized. And there was pressure on one end to try to get the other to submit to their perspective. And that's part of what Kwasi Balagoon criticized about their approach and his many critiques of the party. That's one of the things he emphasized that they were trying to impose their vision onto chapters that they're not a part of. I'm just noticing this common thread between all these things that we've talked about. The 
elitism of some revolutionaries thinking they know better than the masses and the shortcomings of hierarchical organization structures where all decisions are flowing down from a central committee or a person atop the committee who don't know what the individual chapters need and the crude anti-imperialism of putting America at the center of everything and denying the agency of people in those countries or assuming that what their leaders say are responsible for all the people in those countries or what's going on in the ground across on the other side of the country, that kind of thing. And the other connection that I saw that critique is they talk about white anarchist movements being very focused on class and having a superficial understanding of anti-racism that's we all need to unify behind this one thing, this class struggle. That'll solve your black issues or whatever. Like, just come with us. This common thread throughout all of these, tying back into what Sean was talking about at the beginning, this unity and diversity and not a fake unity that flattens differences and pretends that different groups of people don't understand their own situation the best, that everything could be understood through this one filter, this one view. There's really clear writing here on trying to pick apart the ways in which these movements like black nationalism and national liberation struggles can be a part of something bigger while also having that ability to self-determine for themselves what they actually need. So there's not this risk of them being swallowed up in this larger movement that doesn't represent them. And the advice given is like, white anarchists need to take on the struggles of black liberation and take those goals as their own and defend those wins the same way they would defend any other wins. And they make the same arguments for black liberationists need to support national liberation movements of First Nations people, indigenous people. It's a common theme throughout this that we need to appreciate difference in our unity and have solidarity across that difference, not try to impose one framework on everything or everyone. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the white anarchist milieu I don't really talk about them much, but I do know that there have been a lot of white anarchists, even some that I've encountered these days, who have been like, no struggle with the class struggle sort of thing. Even if they incorporate race, they have an incomplete understanding of it, and they assume that the struggle for racial justice is subservient or under the struggle for the liberation of all other classes and the achievement of anarchism, of anarchy. You also end up encountering people who, white anarchists mainly, who don't have a full understanding or awareness of national liberation. I find that it's a lot more understood these days, especially with what's been going on in Palestine and stuff. But there are still those who are rather reductionist in their approach to anarchy. And obviously that comes from a place of privilege that they would have to interrogate and unpack. But I absolutely agree with the overall through line of unity and diversity in terms of recognizing the need for solidarity without uniformity. A solidarity that accommodates solidarity that is, as I say in my National Liberation video actually, solidarity that is a dialogue between people rather than tombs and conditions, conformist sort of solidarity, striving towards, rather than one world, I believe we should strive towards a world in which many worlds can exist. Oh, that reminds me of this Ashanti Alston quote from Beyond Nationalism, but not without it. It's pretty long, so I'm going to have to skim over parts of it, but it's so good. It starts with, Come envision, envision a world of worlds within our world, where there's principled coexistence within the wonderful diversity of the black community. Harlem, Spanish Harlems, hip hop communities, college communities, gay, lesbian, transgender communities, Zulu nation, new African, squatter communities, outlaw communities, Ibogonian, Sierra Leonean, Ethiopian, Rasta communities. Those of us who like to journey through and between communities and sometimes create new mixed ones. 
Then he quotes Ella Baker saying, we can do it if we trust ourselves and get away from leadership-led revolution. Quotes Kwasi Balagoon and Audre Lorde, Harriet Tubman, Franz Fanon, and then ends off asking the question. It started with come envision a world, and he's saying, what if, envision it, how, like Huey Newton's community of communities, beyond nationalism and fully self-determining, embracing our diversity of beliefs, lifestyles, and non-exploitive economic arrangements, reuniting earth-loving peoples with a loving earth. So he's saying that's how. And it ends, through imagination, all is possible. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's a, such a beautiful quote. Yeah, it really is. And another thing he emphasizes related to that, but more succinctly, is basically power to the people where it stays with the people. Simple as that. One of my favorite Bookchin quotes is really, really similar to that. He's like, to me, power to the people means power to the people. And if it doesn't involve power to the people, then it's not power to the people. That's not the exact wording, but that's the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It really is that simple. That's a good distillation of my politics, I would say. If your power to the people involves a standing for the people, I, I don't want it. If your power to the people is you are the voice of the people, I don't want it. Power to the people, where it stays with the people. All power to all the people. We now go to two non-debate bros having a difficult discussion. What's up, bro? How's it hey, going? bro. How you doing? Fist bump me, bro. Up there, so we're doing good. Nice. Any revolutionary thoughts on the mind? Yeah, bro. I was as think, usual. Bro, you know how we're like both devout anti-capitalist bros who want to see a transition to like a post-capitalist society in our lifetime, bro? Bro, yes. Now you're talking my language. Bro, I was just reading online. Capitalists are actually like distracting us these days, bro, with like identity politics and like anti-racism, bro, instead of putting class politics first and making sure that there's like a united proletariat who can like rise up against them bro it's not cool bro. bro 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 no no that way everyone's like fighting with each other right instead of like uniting you're so close bro but just it's, okay. it's one sick plot bro that's kind of true but you're getting this confused bro here i don't think i could say it better than lorenzo Comboa Irvin. i got uh here you mind if i read you a few quotes look if my bro wants to issue a correction to me bro hey i need to be open-minded I need to consider I might be wrong. I need to listen up. Hit me with it, bro. Bro, I appreciate it. So the first thing you need to understand, bro, is that, to quote Irvin, because of the way this nation has developed with the exploitation of African labor and the maintenance of an internal colony, blacks and other non-white peoples are oppressed both as members of the working class and as a racial nationality. By struggling for their human and civil rights, they ultimately come into confrontation with the entire capitalist system, not just individual racists or regions in the country, because based on historically uneven competition, capitalist exploitation is inherently racist. Whoa, so wait, like racism is a constituent part of capitalism, bro? Is that, is that what you're saying, bro? Yeah, bro, yeah. Bro, but, like, shouldn't we focus on, like, common cause? Bro, absolutely. Like, here, I got another Irvin quote for you. He says, the type of organization needed must be a mass organization working to unite all workers in a common class struggle. Right? Like, that's what you're talking about. He's, he's on board. Right. But must be able to recognize the duty to support and adopt the special demands of the black and other non-white peoples as those of the entire class. And Kamboa Irvin also says that white workers should work to abolish the white identity entirely. These white workers should strive for multicultural unity and should work with black activists to build an anti-racist movement and challenge white supremacy. However, it is also very important to recognize the right of the black movement to take an independent road in its own interests because that is what self-determination means. And like, bro, bro, before you say anything, if that freaks you out at all to hear that, just think about this first. 
the whole history of colonialism and capitalism is based on taking away that right of self-determination. So when he's saying that it's important to recognize the right of the black movement to take an independent road in its own interests, he's not saying we shouldn't all work together, right? Like he's talking about working together, but we also have to recognize that you can't work together with people who don't have the choice to not work together with you. If we want actual unity with them, it has to be a true unity based not on, oh, we should all unite because uniting in itself is good, but because they are choosing to work with us because we're choosing to work with them on the things that matter to them, come together on those issues and show them that we're being true to our stated goals of wanting universal emancipation for everyone and following that logic down not just addressing the concerns that seem most prominent to us or seem the most universal to us because they include us. Bro, this is like kind of blowing my mind here. Because racism is a constituent part of capitalism, like to find common cause across the working class has to acknowledge and integrate an anti-racist analysis, bro, is that? Yeah, and he totally agrees with you that this is being used to divide people. Like here again, Irvin. Although the capitalists use the system of white screen privilege to great effect to divide the working class, the truth is that capitalists only favored white workers to use them against their own interest, not because they have true white class unity. The capitalists don't want white labor united with black labor against their rule and the system of exploitation of labor. They invented the white race as a scam to facilitate this exploitation. So the kind of division, bro, that you're worried about, that like we're fighting about race issues rather than dealing with the problems, it's not coming from black people bringing up race issues. It's, it's coming from white workers like us who don't want to listen to it because, you know, we're, we're focused on wanting to see everybody as the same and just fighting around common issues but you know we can't just tell them to put off struggling against white supremacy until after the revolution there's no separation there it's the same system bro so wait like if i understand you correctly and i understand Kampoa Irvin correctly what you're saying is basically like it's not the division over like identity politics that divides the working class it's actually the construction of white supremacy and racism, which was put on us by the ruling class to fucking make there be like no solidarity between like racialized and like so-called white workers who would like perpetuate racism because they would like they want to protect their own position within the system because like the ruling class who's white says like, oh, I'm on your side, we're both white, like, let's take on those guys. And then, like, they're, like, confused by that racism, and then they're fucking turning on their own fellow worker, and then, like, that system is further perpetuated by, like, people who, from a naive attempt at, like, universalism, like me, like, refuse to sort of acknowledge, like, the differential position that, like, white and black workers are in, and, like, shut down and, like, not listen to them about their experiences, and, like, don't integrate their demands and analysis into a universal analysis. Bro. That's fucked up. Yeah, bro, it's bad. You know, as Kamboa Irvin says, as capitalist society decays, people will look for radical and total solutions to the misery they face. And the Nazis and the Klan are among the few right-wing political forces that offer or appear to offer a radical answer to the current problems of society for the white masses. And the fact that these solutions are false will matter little to confused, hysterical people searching desperately for a way out of the socioeconomic crisis that capitalism is facing. Understanding the importance of the struggles against racism, against white supremacy, against colonialism, like, bro, that's what's going to stop people from falling for the fascist line that the problem is immigrants, the problem is non-white people, the problem is multiculturalism, all these fake solutions they put out there, it gets a foothold at that first step of not taking the concerns of non-white people seriously. Bro, 
So wait, like I was thinking like by like downplaying this stuff and like not talking about it that much, we could like keep my like bros who are like fucking white and shit from like getting turned off by like thinking too much about politics of identity and they'd be able to focus on class. Yeah, but really all it does is like by trying not to challenge them to appeal to them, that stuff that we've left unchallenged ends up turning them in the wrong direction. So it's we can't do it. it. It won't work that way, you know? Right. Because of the reality of this, like, you have to challenge your bros and, like, to let them know, like, the truth, right? Bro, you let me know so much stuff about patriarchy that I didn't understand about how, you know, it hasn't already been fixed in the 90s. Like, I used to think, bro, you really helped me understand gender politics so much better. So it's the least I could do to pass on some of this wisdom I'm getting from Kamboa Irvin to you. Put that fist here for that bump. Here we go, bro. Booyah. Yeah, Yeah, nice. And that was two non-debate bros having a productive discussion about race. Welcome to Bloodsport Live Streamer Radio Theater. No, 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 no. You let me talk. for. I let you talk. Now it's my turn, okay? Now, first of all, saying that a tweet isn't for star bellies is segregation. Literally, look up the definition of the word. You can't segregate a tweet. Like, it was just a tweet. A plain belly sneech tweet just for plain bellies. They just want to have no star bellies in one conversation and talk about but, plain uh, belly issues. Just You'd have to follow the logic through. The only way that you could actually stop star bellies from responding to those tweets is to cut off their thumbs and scoop out their eyes. That's where this leads. I'm, so, like, is that I'm what you support? Not, obviously, answer no. The question. Obviously, no. Please, obviously, just I don't. Answer the question. No one supports cutting off star bellies' thumbs. I just really look, nobody does. Plain, yes, no one is saying that you have to cut off star bellies' thumbs to keep them from responding to plain belly tweets. No one is saying that. I may have a star on my belly, but I know for sure that I have done more for the plain belly liberation movement than you or anyone else with the size of my platform. I just think that this is a discussion that needs to happen between sneeches within plain belly communities. They don't need a star bellied savior to like oh, come on the way that you keep pointing out my star belly during this debate over and over again. We get it's so aggressive. Can you just deal with the arguments? I just think that plain belly sneeches have a right to self-determination. That includes deciding whether or not they want to have discussions on issues of anti-plain belly racism with or without star bellies, whether they determine for themselves, whether they live with their oppressors. You know, they've got a right to do these things. They've got a right to oh, determine what uh, their uh, own uh, self-determination. Stop, stop, stop. You're gish galloping again. I feel like I'm arguing. Gish gal- with it's a- self-determination. I feel like I'm arguing with a star belly supremacist genocide promoter right now it's like well, you would know flashbacks to it it's literally the exact same arguments oh we just want self-determination it's just living separately it's the context we should just talk about the context it. is like opposite but like look the right of colonized people to self-determination is like recognized in international law you know like the un has ratified it it's not like some star-bellied nazi idea Star belly supremacists take the rhetoric of plain belly liberation and they try to apply it and take it for themselves. And like you just completely credulously fall this for it. This is amazing. You know, if I closed my eyes and couldn't see the video, I would have assumed I was talking to a star belly supremacist right now. I, <laughs> I actually can't tell if you are one. Okay. Mask off. I mean, that's a moment where your mask really slipped off. It's my actually mask. kind of clear where you stand. That was I, just. <laughs> that is rich. That my mask has slipped off when. Well, to be fair, your mask has been off the whole well, time. Actually, you just, your mask slipped you off. You didn't even bring a mask. And you never did answer my question about scooping out the eyes. You take star belly supremacists at their word while <sighs> talking down to and ignoring sneeches who actually experience what it's you like. You know what? If this is the level of discussion we're going to be That's having... That's why people call you a star bellied anarchist. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I ended the call. Hung up. Sorry, folks. I know... People were enjoying that in the chat, and it's always fun when things get lively, but I just can't deal with it. I tried to be polite. I really did. Go back and listen to the VOD at the beginning. I was being so nice at the beginning. Star-bellied anarchist. You know, that's just like 
those other times that this has came up, or that time the person said I had star-bellied fragility. The reason that this keeps happening is because other people are unreasonable. All right, it's, uh, let's go over donos. A $50 dono to start. Wow, that plain-bellied sneech had zero arguments, zero logic, and you totally owned them in that debate. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I am a pro. Uh, next dono. I'm starting to think that if it weren't for these horrible, aggressive, plain belly Sneech advocates, we could have achieved a full, unified Sneech socialism by now. You know, I couldn't agree more. You know, I didn't want to say it because, you know, I don't even know if they mean well. I was going to say they mean well, but part of me thinks they don't. I don't even know anymore. But their optics are the reason that we haven't achieved Sneech socialism by now. Uh, next dono. <clears throat> This so-called plain belly Sneech advocate can't even answer a simple question about whether they support the cutting off of star belly thumbs? Yeah, I tried to make them answer the question, but they just wouldn't do it. Really telling about what they feel about cutting those thumbs off. Really, really telling. This is what keeps me up at night. It's a problem. It's a big problem. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Bloodsport Livestreamer Radio Theater. One thing that I found really useful to think about that has helped me grasp the way that representative democracy or the political representation of groups by individuals is flawed or has these predictable outcomes that are less than what you would want is looking to the world of social democracy and electoral politics with the understanding that when people get involved with it, it is actually the case. And I know this because I used to work in campaigns as a campaign manager and other things here in Canada in an earlier lifetime. The people who are running for office really do think they are going to do their best to be as ethical and gracious and present and bring the information to the people and do everything that a politician should. People who run for office really do often think that, especially on the sort of left and center left. They think that they are going to be able to be a representative for their people effectively and that they're going to be able to rise to the moral heights, the ethical heights that are required to govern with wisdom and be beyond the typical politics as usual. But predictably what happens, and I mean, I don't mean to completely shit on the character of all politicians uh, <laughs> over time. I think it's possible. And there's people I'm thinking of in particular, Jean Swanson in Vancouver is awesome. And I could name more. We had her on the show once. She's a city councillor. She donates like half her paycheck to local activist groups and stuff like that. These forces and these structures and particular political parties they involve mediating all the differences between these perspectives through these subtle forces of capitulation, insider dealings, making deals in private and all this sort of stuff. And being in that realm within the electoral social democratic realm, it creates these patterns of thought and behavior that will bring any politician out of sync with the people they seek to represent. Yeah. We could look at this as almost like a mathematical or scientific equation. The longer someone is in office, presuming that they act the way that politicians usually do and they focus on the things that politicians usually do and they listen to the advice they get from their colleagues when they join and stuff like that, the further that you're in office, the further in your power, the more there are these pressures to make compromises, or you mentioned earlier, Andrew, this sort of accumulation of little injustices that you start to defend. I feel like it's really a good intuition pump for people because we all shit on social Democrats all the time. The position is self-justifying, basically self-perpetuating. Positions of power do that. They perpetuate themselves. They perpetuate their own power. And so even if you don't succumb to it, which everyone does, if you don't, then you're not going to be there for very long because the system can only operate when the actors within it work to perpetuate it. And you're incentivized to perpetuate it, to dismiss the little injustices, to do things the way they've always been done, let things slide, to make compromises. That's the dead end. And I'll be a little bit provocative here, and I'll say that I do think that revolutionaries are politicians, or they can be in the sense of having these same types of self-perpetuating things, the self-justifying things, or the structures that bring you to a situation, the electoral structures that bring you to power, for example, you then need to carry some water for those structures in order to maintain your own power. And the same thing can apply in different ways in revolutionary contexts where command and control leadership is part and parcel of it. The forces that rise up command and control leaders in these organizations, even if they're the purest ethical, and I think in many cases across the board, people are coming from very pure ethical stances and they're doing their best. 
But there's this predictable thing that happens, like you said, of the way that these things self-perpetuate, the way they turn on themselves, the way that they justify themselves, it creates distortions. I bring up the social democratic example because I think that it's an easy way to grasp something that's a lot more complex and varied in the revolutionary environment, but gives a really strong basis because we can see it happening all the time. You could elect all Bernie Sanders and at the end of their careers, they'll all be Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we literally see the limits of it. When you only look at your own country's political situation, it's easy to sort of brush past some of these critiques and say, oh no, if we try it here, maybe it'll work. But when you actually take a more global look at the way that these things have turned out, the repeated failures of these sorts of politicians across the world to meaningfully transform the conditions of the people and to actually keep power in hands to people, it's easy to see that it's a dead end. You find a lot of Americans, they want social democracy, basically. But you have people who are living under social democracies who are saying that, yeah, in some aspects it's better, but you've created this idealization of it that obscures the reality of it, that it doesn't actually meaningfully end the injustices of the world. It ends some injustices in your home territory. It may make you more comfortable or more secure, but at what cost and who is bearing that cost? As long as people have limited their scope of analysis, their fight against injustice will be incomplete. I experience it especially with Americans because the privilege of being an American is that you don't have to think about other countries Whereas basically every other country has to think about America. I find once people step outside of that American bubble, especially sock dems, look outside of that American bubble of, well, this is what we want here and we're just going to fight for that and that alone. You'll see that not only does that not really address the problems domestically, it also doesn't even come close to addressing the problems being inflicted globally. And so if your system cannot respond to, cannot end those injustices, what are you fighting for? Because it's not justice that you're fighting for. Because a more complete justice would be one that takes people outside of your desired Sockdam utopia into account. But it doesn't. I feel like right now there's a lot of people, in particular Americans, who have through the candidacies of Bernie Sanders and you know, there's a lot of critiques of Ocasio-Cortez around and stuff like that. The part of me that's been deeply sympathetic to anarchism for a long time, I'm not really surprised to see the limits of these systems reached so soon and so easily. And from the outside, I've seen a lot of people who have had their hopes dashed by it, who became kind of blackpilled. Bernie 2020 was their last hope of a better world. And with Bernie being pushed out and Biden becoming president, that's the frontiers of normie politics. It's now you have to wait for another president and hopefully we'll get a good one eventually. And I feel like anarchism and the thoughts of some of these black anarchists in particular can be a useful corrective to that sort of hopelessness, that doomer pill. Once one experiences the limitations of these offices, it can be the basis for the development of a deeper, more nuanced and more varied politics. Yeah. So I thought maybe this discussion could be a good pivot to talk about some of the methodology of anarchism and some of the proposals that we could both look to from the tradition of writing from these authors, but also in the current moment. One of the things that anarchism is often critiqued of, I think maybe unfairly, but I'd say the heart of the critique is people say, I don't understand anarchism, and that is their critique. <laughs> That's a very historically grounded critique. <laughs> yeah. People think that anarchism as a political project doesn't have a serious route to transform the world, that it's vague or contradictory, and that we need like strong men to take over it for us as one version of it, or we need to be more pragmatic and not demand everything all at once is another version of it. So I wanted to open the floor to talk a little bit about social anarchist methodology in this context and what are the frontiers of political action within this framework. It's important to understand, first and foremost, that the anarchist view of the revolution, for the most part, and I think you can't really say the anarchist view of anything because Part of anarchism is that whole multiplicity of perspectives. We're not called Kropotkinist for a reason. <laughs> exactly. I would say that the focus of anarchism, the anarchist view of revolution, my understanding of anarchism, is primarily prefigurative in the sense that we're not waiting for some grand French Revolution moment where we storm the Bastille and guillotine a bunch of rich people or whatever. The revolution is something that is 
a process. It's something that is happening right now and it is something that we all have responsibility to shape. The frontiers by which we shape it vary depending on our capabilities, depending on our focuses. But I think that some of the main, the primary battlegrounds, I suppose, of the revolution for anarchists are the neighborhood, the local territory where you live, whether it be a town, a city district, a rural parish or whatever, and the workplace. But I would also extend the workplace, quote unquote, as including the school, because I think there's a lot of ground that could be covered there. Other struggles would be within the social realm in terms of the family and community, and also broader structures like the patriarchy, white supremacy, that sort of thing. And the struggle is, of course, against all of these beasts. It's against capitalism, it's against statism, it's against the various means by which people are dominated in their lives. And so the prefigurative process is basically pushing back against that domination, but in that process of pushback, also carving out a space where space is created for it, where eventually ruptures can emanate from those spaces. It's twofold. You are fighting the system and you are building the alternative system in the process. And both these things are happening simultaneously because if you just seize the state one day and you don't have those structures in place, well, you're going to run into some problems. If your aim is communism, is anarchy, the means by which you reach those ends, those aims, has to be connected with them. You don't jump from a representative government to anarchy. Anarchy is something that you make now, that you create now, you create the relationships for now, you sow the seeds for now. I guess that's the best way that I can think of to summarize the anarchist approach to revolution. Really well put. The way that Irvin characterizes this, the dual power in this quote I have is super powerful. He says, the idea behind a mass commune is to create a dual power structure as a counter to the government under conditions which exist now. The realization of this aim means that we can build inner city communes, which will be centers of black counterpower and social revolutionary culture against the white political power structures in the principal cities of the United States. Once they assume hegemony, such communes would be an actual alternative. It would serve as a living revolutionary example to North American progressives and other oppressed nationalities. This black communalism would be both a repository of black culture and ideology. We would hold black consciousness raising sessions in school, community centers, prisons, and in black communities all over North America, which would teach black history and culture, new liberating social ideas and values to children and adults, as well as counseling and therapy techniques to resolve family and marital problems, all while giving a black revolutionary perspective to the issues of the day. But there must also be some way to ensure their economic survival. It is then when the commune, a network of community organizations and institutions, assumes its greatest importance. We will build a socio-political infrastructure to intervene in every area of black lives, food and housing cooperatives, black liberation schools, people's banks and community mutual aid funds, medical clinics and hospitals rodent control and pest extermination programs, cooperative factories, community cultural and entertainment centers, and the establishment of an intercommunal electronic communications network, land and building reclamation projects, public works brigades to rebuild cities, youth projects, drug clinics, and many other such programs. So yeah, that's the quote. It's just such a wide, detailed, thorough example of what it means to build the new world in the shell of the old. Yeah, because part of the transformation is psychological. You have to be able to show people that they have the capacity to take their own lives into their own hands, to manage their own society rather than placing it into the hands of politicians, because politicians will always disappoint as we just discussed with regard to Bernie and AOC. But with these sorts of practices grounded in your own capabilities and your own action, it's a good preventative measure against that doomerist mindset that boohoo, the politician I wanted didn't get into office. So we've lost hope. When you're grounded in that action, whether it be that you are 
building robust networks of mutual aid that can weather the consequences of climate collapse or creating a space by which young people can recognize their potential as agents of their own lives and of the society they want to live, they want to live in. Whatever it is you're doing, it should be making a tangible material impact on the people around you and it should be building the structures that you would see in the world that you want to live in. It's not a matter of waiting for these things to magically materialize. It's a matter of creating them. Totally. We were talking about before in the way that power can propagate itself. If you're building a transitionary institution that's fundamentally different than the institution you want to create in the end, you create these dual incentives where even if someone wants to convert to a system that's an ideal future system in their mind. Once you're in a position of power, once institutions of power exist, those institutions are going to tend to perpetuate themselves. So what this proposal does, what the prefigurative anarchist building of the society that we want to create thing does is invert that dynamic. Because if you're able to create people power, if you're able to create democratic institutions and participatory mechanisms that people can feel the difference of participating in to know that they have that control over their own lives, they have agency over their own political life. The same way that a politician or a czar or dictator or king is going to hold on to power when people try to take it away from them. If the people are given power and they're given institutions where they're able to self-determine their own lives, take care of each other. I wouldn't say given, I would say when people take power. Right, yeah. Once people have taken power, they're not going to want to give it up. I agree 100%. Like, that's a really great way of putting it. I think you're right that correction is right in the sense that people have to take power, but people also have to be helped to realize they can. When we think about the political development of masses of people into these political structures, it's right to say that it's not given to them from on high, here you go, or something like that. But it also feels not right perfectly to say that they're just going to take it either because it's this cooperative, flourishing process. I get what you're trying to say. You're not giving a man a fish. You're more like teaching a man to fish, but not in the conservative individualist interpretation of that scene. One way to say it might be, once we have all taught ourselves to take power, and we have taken that power and exercised it, then we might fight to maintain our institutions of collective power the same way that hierarchical institutions of domination, command and control are fought for by those who command those things. Agreed. When people are able to collectively command things and experience like, yes, not everything is going to go your way. You're going to have discussions and debates. None of us is the dictator of this system, but experiencing the freedom of that participation and feeling it work, it uses that dynamic for good. Yeah. I would add to that as well. It's not just a matter of that freedom of participation or that freedom of association, which is something that anarchists emphasize, I would also say experiencing the freedom of disassociation in the sense that you are not confined to this political system that is imposed on you. You're not confined like a serf into a particular situation, living situation or working situation, because that's the only opportunity available to you. It's the freedom to disassociate as well, the freedom to choose not to be a part of that and to create your own thing if needs be. The freedom to not have something imposed on you from above, but rather to be able to create your own thing anew. I think that's just as encouraging and exhilarating as the freedom of association. Yeah, not being able to leave an institution that's not working for you is such a brutal part of every system I'm aware of. Yeah, it reminds me too of the, like you mentioned, the internal aspect of revolution and you had a video, Why the Revolution Needs Therapy. Yes. It strikes me that a lot of the difference between being given power and taking power and Sean mentioning people need to be given the idea that they can take it kind of thing. The discussion in the Alston essay that you pull from there of how society limits the ways that children can think and react and feel and experience themselves becomes a way through which these power structures reproduce themselves. And part of the process of taking power for ourselves is getting back in touch with that spontaneous 
experience of our actual desires and not this imposed he calls it a mask he talks about it in terms of this mask that people build up yeah getting beyond that is getting back in touch with your own ability to think for yourself or have an authentic experience of your life in the world and it strikes me just that an essential part of genuine participation in a democratic structure is being able to authentically represent and understand yourself so that you can go into these group decision-making processes in the most productive way possible, but also in the way that is free of these imposed, internalized thought structures. That's just the way that power reproduces itself all over the place. It dovetails into the white anarchism thing again, just the ways that this white common sense limits the ways that people can see what revolutionary change might look like. Yeah, I agree. That's actually one of the videos that I made that I find is one of the more important concepts that I now hold for people in general to grasp because discussion is being had, but not enough discussion is being had on the ways in which our childhoods and our experiences as children, how we treat children in society replicates and recreates these modes of oppression. Part of your involvement in revolution should be deconstructing that mask that's been constructed for you in your childhood and in your life experience so that you can free your imagination to think and to create more boldly and to shape your environment and to shape yourself more freely. I'm really glad you brought it back to childhood stuff too, because when you brought it up earlier and you'd said something like, maybe this is an immature example, connecting school and authoritarianism in my head, I was like, no, no, this is really, really important. I really think that analyzing the way that we treat children, analyzing what's been called childism, the way that children are not treated as human beings in our society, that they're treated as people who have very, very abridged rights, who have very limited potentials, yeah. often against what the children themselves say or achieve. Like if I hear a kid complaining about school, my first instinct is to say that kid is probably right about that fucking school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it as an immature thing at all for a child to reject a school system that is wasting their time, treating them as cattle, you know, not even engaging their intelligence. I think the fate of children and the way that we treat children in society is of fundamental importance when we're talking about the society we want to create. And I think it also connects to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this discussion of how this revolutionary sense of self-sacrifice is a cannon fodder idea because Part of the reason that revolutionaries are better off alive is because the next generation needs their wisdom and insight and experiences. And I see it as a very revolutionary thing to turn towards care work and turn towards the nourishing of children and facilitating the development of children into full, well-balanced adults who are ready to challenge injustice in society. Yeah. It's an important avenue, not even avenue, I would say it's foundational stuff. Anti-authoritarian Papa. Uh, hey, anti-authoritarian Papa. Papa, we need to talk to you. Yeah. Yes, yes, what is it? We think you have some confusions. Okay, and where do you think my confusions lie? You've raised us all this time to believe not in authority, but don't you think that a revolution is the most authoritarian thing there is? Oh boy, has someone given you to on authority? We read it online. Someone linked it to us. By Engels, the factory owner. It's a fragment from the 1870s, What, what are you implying about Engels? What, what, well, does he own a factory? I think his uh, position as a white man in the 19th century, a factory owner and a political thinker, would have obscured his perspective on issues such as these. But Papa, he says anti-authoritarians don't know what they're talking about. Well, I think they that... They create nothing but confusion. Well, you see, the issue with Engels on authority is that he starts off with a straw man. A straw man that presents anti-authoritarianism as some sort of immature exercise, whereby we reject all coordination and cooperation, where we discard the use of force, where we attempt to abolish the present order with just one stroke. But the truth is that if we want to create a better world, a world free of authority, we are going to have to exercise our power as a collective to coordinate to make decisions without the use of authority. The truth is that 
for as long as the will of authority is imposed on us, our ability to act and meaningfully work in the struggle would ultimately prove futile. But, uh, isn't it hypocritical to oppose authority when the authority is needed for the moving of industry and factories like the ones that Engels owned? Yeah, like how can a railroad operate? Isn't the first condition of the job a dominant will that settles all subordinate questions, Papa? Doesn't somebody need to be in charge? Quite the opposite. You see, the experience of workers in struggle, which a factory owner like Engels may have missed, has shown that it's the resistance to authority that allows for the functioning of a factory. The factory would grind to a halt if workers were to submit to the authority to the letter, which is why we have direct action practices like working to rule or working without enthusiasm. You see, when a worker follows authority to the letter and does not exercise their own autonomy, industry itself grinds to a halt. Because the factory requires the autonomous activity of workers, thinking and acting for themselves, to solve the problems they face during the day without the intervention of authority. Papa, you, is it not true that the striking workers are imposing their authority over their bosses when they strike or when they act autonomously? Isn't it the case, Papa, that it's not that authority is abolished, but rather it's changed in qualitative feature? Well, son, I think you are confusing authority with the use of force. You see, when we speak of authority, we're speaking of a particular kind of authority, that is hierarchical authority. It is the imposition of decisions rather than the agreement to abide by collective decisions and to abide freely and associate freely with our fellow workers. When we govern ourselves, we are not imposing authority onto others. We are allowing ourselves to make decisions freely from below without the imposition of those above. It would be like saying that to loosen yourself from chains To remove handcuffs is to act in authority over the handcuffs. It would be like saying that for slaves to liberate themselves and to burn the plantation of their master would be the same as to become masters over their masters. It is a conflation that completely obscures the way that hierarchical authority pervades and oppresses. Papas think that they can change the name of things and then change the things themselves. And by that, they make a mockery of the whole world. I'm rebelling against the authority of my anti-authoritarian father. Wouldn't you say that humans have subdued the forces of nature by our knowledge and inventive genius, and therefore to abolish authority would mean abolishing all of industry and the power of the loom itself? Well, son... I think our relationship with nature is one that actually needs to be reevaluated. To impose our will onto nature without a consideration for how nature operates is an exercise in self-destruction. What we need is to work with nature, not imposing or dominating upon it, but to operate with it as conscious individuals cooperating with those forces as equals. Okay, that makes sense, Papa. I thought you were betraying the movement of the proletariat, but what you're saying makes sense. Maybe this old essay by a factory owner from the past doesn't have all the answers I thought it did. I appreciate you coming to me with this, son. Remember to always question my position as your Papa. You know, no anti-authoritarian Papa looks forward to the authority talk, but I should have known it was inevitable. I'm glad you kids came to me. Now, let's go burn down Chase back. Yay! Yay! Can I light the match? Sure, son, but I'll carry the gasoline. Well, we are unfortunately running out of time. This has been an incredible discussion, really, really interesting and stimulating. I wanted to ask, Andrew, if you have any last thoughts before we go, anything else that you'd like to share? I just want to leave us off with Uh, Another very relevant Ashanti Aston quote. He says, We do not have a way to figure out this revolution beforehand. Walking, we'll ask questions. We'll turn to each other and, with humility, ask, What do you know? And what do you know? Let's put that on the table. And to bring it around in a way, unity in diversity and diversity in unity. 
I guess that's been the through line of our discussion today. And I think it's a good note to leave people to mull over until next time. Absolutely. Thank you again for coming on the show and talking with us about this. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciated it. It's been a great discussion. I just noticed in Lorenzo Camboa Irvin's demand list, he mentions shortening the work week. So he's also a Monday abolitionist like us. Ah, uh, yes. He's also a, a fellow Garfieldist, I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm an Irvinist, Alstonist, Garfield thought. <laughs> uh, and I love, he says 20 to 30 hours too. None of this like, oh, let's go down to 32 or it's, you know, 20 to 30 with no reduction in pay right on the money there. He's got it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to give a shout out to your YouTube channel or any other places that people can check you out? Yeah, you can find me on YouTube at St. Andrewism. And you can also follow me on Twitter at underscore St. Andrew. Cool. And I can't endorse these video essays enough. This is an organic confluence in positions on things. But Andrew's got a video on the guillotine, the history of the guillotine, why it's bad. There's so many things that you're going to find in these videos that are complementary with the stuff that we've talked about on our show. I really, really highly recommend these videos. Oh, thank you. <laughs> One in particular, the carnival video, because besides being about a really interesting historical incident that I didn't know a lot about, it also gets into some of these philosophical questions around dancing and the revolution. It's a great video. I think people will get a lot out of it. Yeah, I concur as someone who made the video. <laughs> Are you serious? I just delirious. Are you hearing this? Cause it's serious. Next time on Seriously Wrong, they get this show on the road. Well, it's the end of this one, so yeah, we're packing pack, it up. And... Packing everything up. You know, when, when a traveling show stops, they unpack, they do the show, and then when the show's over, they pack everything up, and then they get that show on the road, and that's what we're doing. You no, know, I always say to Sean when we're getting to the end of one episode that each episode between... I, oh, now I'm forgetting it. There lies a road. A road. Uh, there is a road to the next episode, or there is a road... To each episode, there is a road. To each episode, there is a road. That's what she said. I believe I forgot my own common saying. Well, it's tired. You know, you travel on this road. You travel. You you set up. You do the show. show, And then you pack it up. And then you travel. Who could remember something when you have a life like that? Metaphorically speaking. I mean, we don't. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not actually a road show. But that's so true that getting to each new episode, you embark down a road. You know, there's so many things you're recording, editing, thinking, and just it's a road. It it's, is a road. And in a metaphorical sense, yeah, of obviously. Course. And like it's a road, sometimes it takes its toll. Oh, yeah, right. Because like a toll and a toll road. That Only on actually... some roads. But I've heard it called mobility pricing to put like tolls everywhere to like put more financial incentives around using cars less and stuff. Some people are really into that, but some people are really against it. Yeah, I can see how it would be good in a lot of ways, but then also put extra barriers for certain people who probably don't deserve it. Depends a lot, too, on the area and what alternatives are available. And uh, Right. Yeah. And you got to build up the alternatives first before you start penalizing people. You need to make sure you give them meaningful options. Anyways, let's get this show on the road. What do you say? I say it looks like we're just about done packing up. So getting the show on the road is the logical next step from here. If you just went on the road without packing up the show first, you'd be getting on the road, but not with this show. It wouldn't be like, get this show on. It would just be like, get on the road and leave the show behind, which is obviously not what we want to do. Imagine you're like, you're, you want to move on. And you're like, hey, can we, can we get on the road and leave this show behind? It actually would apply really well in a lot of circumstances, you know, like you're not actually a lot of times people say that they're not actually metaphorically gathering a show to get on the road. True. So maybe people should say that. You know, it's funny. Every time I'm done with a show, I'm like, oh, I'm just looking forward to get back to the road. But then once I'm on the road, I'm looking forward to the next show. It, It is like that sometimes. Yeah.